announcer, Thomas Triber. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived for Inside Boxing Weekly. So here are your hosts, Mike Goodpaster, John Einreinhofer, and Jeremiah Pricer on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly. We are live post-fight after we actually had some entertaining fights today. We had a little bit of controversy. I'm your co-host for the Inside Boxing Weekly show, which is brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation. And I forgot to say my name, which is Mike Goodpaster, but we're live, so things happen. Uh, next, I want to bring in my co-host, Jeremiah Pricer. How you doing, Jeremiah? I'm excited to be here. I'm always excited to be here. Let's talk some boxing, fellas. And, of course, our resident attorney for any time Jeremiah needs to be bailed out of jail, John Einreinhofer. How you doing, John? Mike, good to be here, and uh, a analyzing the fights is getting to be harder than analyzing legal cases nowadays. So, <laughs> well, well, not my, Jeremiah's my legal gets... cases, though, because they'll keep <laughs> yeah, you mine, busy. Yeah, mine are cut and dry. My, <laughs> my, mind's getting, my, mind's get, my mind's getting more drained after a Saturday of boxing action than it is reading the law books lately. Nothing is ever cut and dry. We'll start off with tonight's PBC card from Brooklyn, New York at the Barclays Center. We'll start off with Dominic Brazil, who stopped Carlos Negron in the ninth round. As always, John, he was entertaining, if nothing else. Yeah, that's what I like about Brazil. He's good for boxing in that sense. You have to understand there's there's no uh, arguing the guy is, is very flawed. But, you know, he's got tremendous power. He's big. He's got a lot of heart. And, uh, you know, he, he gets hit. He's vulnerable. He gets wild. So, you know, he, he provides a lot of entertainment. He's a, he's a guy you want to see fight for those reasons. And tonight wasn't really any different against Negron. You know, he was getting tagged himself and having some problems. But uh, you know, he kept throwing that big right-handed hammer, and he, he got a big one in, and that was the end of Negron. But he provided entertainment as usual. Yeah, but he should not be the mandatory contender for anybody. No, I don't follow any of the alphabet stuff. Hey, so. maybe for Manuel I mean, Char, maybe he could be the number one contender for him. That's what I mean. If we want to make fun of the alphabet stuff, fine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when people start talking about these mandatories and, and they were doing it with White and they people do it with Brazil, and it's just asinine to me. So uh, I, I'll address it in that sense, but not taking it seriously. All right, next up, Jermel Charlo gets upset by Tony Harrison, unanimous 10-round or 12-round decision. Um, oh, hell, I forgot. Do you want to talk about Dominic Brazil, Jeremiah? <laughs> that's how highly you think of the heavyweight division, huh, Mike? <laughs> that's, that's how highly I think of Dominic Brazil and Carlos yeah. Negron. Yeah, yeah. The, the only thing, uh, I would say a few things is in that, you know, Dominic Brazil does provide entertainment, like John said. And I think that's what we've got to at least appreciate about the, the, the current heavyweight landscape is that, you know, whether, I, you know, I know... Mike and I don't think highly of the guy's talent, but there's a lot of fun guys in the division. And I saw that Adam Konaki was in, in the crowd, so I don't know if maybe that's a, a plan for the future after Konaki fights Gerald Washington. Maybe so, but it's it's a good, interesting, fun styles matchup. Uh, you know, this this was nothing more than to keep Dominic Brazil busy but i did like the right hand i mean it was this big looping shot hit him but hit him you know behind the the ear and and he was you know pretty much gone from there but uh yeah i mean he, he's he's lacking a lot of skill you know surprisingly he did did pretty well in the amateur ranks but uh, yeah i mean he's just providing fun at this point and i don't want to see him against deontay wilder you know the the alphabet soup guys should just keep letting you know fury and joshua j just let them sort that out and let the other guys sort their thing out all right, next up, as I already said, Jamel Charlo got upset by Tony Harris in the night. Unanimous 12-round decision. John, did you agree with the decision? Was it a robbery or just a close fight? That's what I was debating because uh, this was on one where I was on the end where I agreed with everybody and thought Jamel Charlo won. I didn't think he looked great, and then I had to grapple with the philosophical <laughs> boxing call of, was it a robbery? It's what I was thinking at first, but I, I have to settle down a little and just say it, it's one of those. I mean, I thought Jermel Charlo clearly won, but it's one of those fights like 
I've been talking about. You know, when you've got all these close rounds and nobody's really doing anything, I thought they were all close rounds that Jermel Charlo was winning. I thought Harrison came to survive. I didn't think Jermel Charlo looked good. I thought he reverted back to the old boring Jermel Charlo, the one that used to use the jab a lot and not power punch. And except for the Lubin fight, it's starting to look like it might just be those KOs were coming from who he was in with rather than that he's really changed, as you saw with Harrison. But I just thought Harrison was in a, in a survival-type mode. And, uh, you know, I, I really didn't give him many rounds, but, you know, they, they were like, you know, weren't like real dominant rounds by Jermel Charlo. You know, from my own scoring of the fight, I didn't think it was close. And I, but I don't want to make like uh, Jermel Charlo had a great performance because I didn't think he did. But I think it just gets back to, you know, either either we're gonna either they're gonna have to start scoring more even rounds again, or this never works when they try it. But they could try it again. And in the, in the late '80s, for a while, New York tried to encourage the judges for a brief period of time, but they didn't stick with it. Where, you know, you're gonna have to have more like. 10 8 and 10 7 rounds where there's not a knockdown just when the round's more clear and these rounds that uh nothing much is happening that they're the 10 9 rounds i i think it, it it's simpler to just have more even rounds but i thought jermel charlo clearly won it it seemed that everybody else did but it's kind of one of those fights like these ones we've debated where i'm just on the other side of that a lot of these rounds were close and it's it's probably just judges having different interpretations of the stuff. I didn't see it their way on this one, though. No, yeah, but they didn't have different interpretations. They all agreed. I think this. I, I think the fight was closer to most people thought it was. I think the PBS announcers tonight were absolutely atrocious. Um, I don't have a problem with it either way, because to me, neither one looked that good, because neither one are that good. I mean, the Charlo brothers are so overrated and protected that this is what happens when they fight somebody that's even remotely halfway decent, Jeremiah. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen some of their performances. Well, I mean, the 154-pound Charlo, he hasn't looked as dominating as his 160-pound brother. So, you know, we've known for a while that, you know, he just kind of seems like he's on a lesser playing field. But, you know, when you – over. Uh, the rounds can be close, but you can still have a clear enough winner, and that's how I saw the the Charlo Harrison fight. Harrison has a really good jab. I mean, I like that. The guy's got talent. We all recognize that. You know, he was giving Jared Hurd a tough fight before. Uh, you know, before that 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 show was closed. So again, you know, the the dude's got talent. You know, and it, actually, I was impressed how well he was out jabbing. Uh, Charlo, but he wasn't using it enough. I mean, he like John said, he was just being outworked just about every single round. Uh, you know, it's, again, it's one of those things like, sure, you know, maybe it's a, a an eight to four type fight, but Charlo, I think, was was edging them clear enough. The problem is when, you, when your number one criteria is clean, effective punches, Harrison's just not doing that. I mean, his his power shots were few and far in between. And again, Charlo wasn't landing a ton clearly, but he was doing the work. Uh, so to me, that was a clear Charlo victory. I mean, it, it sucks because what now we're going to get a rematch, and I just think it's unnecessary because after watching Jarrett Hurd, you know, take apart Wellborn, and you know, then Charlo enter, enters the ring, and they, you know, they're lipping off with one another. Uh, for me, it's just that's the road we should have gone. You know, Charlo should have gotten the decision, and then we see Charlo versus Hurd, and you get. I believe that would make a a brand new champion. I mean, I would much rather see that than a Harrison Charlo rematch. I I, I just I don't get it. I, I mean, I I think Charlo is right in the sense that he was slighted. Uh, you know, whether you call it an outright robbery, I don't know. But the thing is, I haven't seen anybody of note score that fight for Harrison. It, it, it's just it, – it, this is part of the reason – we'll move on to the Korobov thing, but this is just one of the many reasons why boxing can't be mainstream. It's it's nights like this where they keep shooting themselves in the foot. All right. Well, you know, both yeah. of you guys, I just want to add one thing. Both of you guys made a good point on something. First of all, Mike did make a good point that – which I knew but wasn't thinking at the time. I'm thinking of what everybody else said, which Jeremiah pointed out. Um, in this fight, all three judges did score it for Harris, and there wasn't even different interpretations. Well, there might have been by the rounds, though. See, that's the thing. There wasn't yeah. in the final result. But you actually have to break down the round-by-round round cards. But this was a bit different that 
it was actually an anonymous decision, but, uh, you know, um, Jeremiah made a good point too. In this one, I actually, it's not exaggerating either. I didn't see anybody, anybody literally <laughs> straight out say that they scored the fight for Harrison. The best I saw was somebody who then, I'm speculating, isn't a big fan of Jermel Charlo, and after the results came out, said, I could have seen it 115, 113 for Harrison. That's well, that, that was the farthest I saw anybody go. In other words, I, I literally haven't seen, at this point, I haven't seen any person except the three judges that said they thought Harrison won the fight. Well, my point is this. The thing that upsets me is when you get a close score by a couple judges and then a 119-109. to 109. That's the thing that always pisses me off and makes me think something's up. With a fight like this, I'm thinking maybe they just were inept. So, But when you get the huge score that goes the one way, and we're going to talk about that in a second, because I, I, I don't know, John, but Matt Korobov won more than one round against Jamal Charlo. Yeah, I thought he earned a draw, probably, in my eyes in that fight. Uh, the only thing that was – well, not only. There was a lot of close rounds in that fight, so I don't want to say the only. But there's ones that you know I gave to Jermall Charlo. I could have given to Korobev, and there's ones I gave to Korobev. I could have given to Jermall Charlo. And then the final tough decision was I just gave Jermall Charlo a 10-9 in the 12th. Ooh. I wouldn't argue. See, I had Charlo Wooden because eight. I thought I thought there's no doubt that's a ten eight round because I don't think Korobov did much of anything other than get the shit smacked out of him for the last three minutes. And and, and I and I think that's reasonable. And on my card, that would have given Jermall Charlo the fight, but I had it a draw. I, I had I was grappling with that and ended up making it a ten nine, but certainly a ten eight was reasonable. Yeah, and, and my thing with this fight, Jeremiah, is this with Korobov. He hadn't fought in a year and a half, and he was training for an eight-round fight. So you could kind of see this happening at the end of this. I mean, he's not Willie Monroe. He's a good fighter. And it just makes you wonder what would happen if two months ago he knew he was fighting Jamal Charlo. Yeah, or, or even more, you know, to the point, I think, is if this was a, a Korobov of, you know, a 32-year-old Korobov, you know, the guy who fought Andy Lee. I mean, uh, to me, Korobov looked older. I mean, he wasn't – anybody should go and, and check the tape with him and Andy Lee. I mean, he was sharper in that fight. Or or the Ustagai fight. I was watching that before the Charlo fight. He was quick in the, the Ustagai fight. And he, in this fight, he was quick – also, but I think part of that was because he's been doing this for so long. You know, his his reflexes and timing is so fine tuned because of his excellent amateur career, and you know he's been doing it in the pros. I mean, this is this is something that he's been doing for his his job. I mean, the 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 guy is 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 savvy. I mean, again, he's been doing it forever. But yeah, if if Korobov had more time to train for it, I, I think Korobov earns it because I had it a draw as well, and. Just like I do with any of these fights, I hop on social media, especially Twitter, because you know that's the water cooler cooler of social media. And my Coppinger from the ring, he had it a draw. Uh, Ryan Sanglia of the ring, he had it for Korobov. Uh, Keith Eidick from a boxing scene, he had it for Korobov. Uh, you know, it, it, neither one of those guys had a. a um, uh, a particular scorecard, but uh, Idik, you know, used the term that Korobov probably deserved to win. Uh, you know, Ryan said deserved to win. So for me, it, it, like it, it, there were some some rounds that you could give to either guy, you know, so you, you can't really argue a robbery except for the guy who had an 11 to one, but it's, it's atrocious. I, I mean, for me, Korobov took the first, first four rounds, then he took the eighth and then he took the 11th. I mean, what you saw in the beginning was Korobov, Again, he's savvy. I mean, the guy, like I said, he's been doing it forever. He kept baiting. He was out thinking Charlo. He was baiting him into left hands. You know, whenever Charlo would throw that straight right hand, he would duck to his left, throw to the body. You know, he was landing that straight left hand with uh, regularity in the early going. And then again, I thought I thought he started to do the same thing in the eighth, and he did the same thing in the eleventh. And not only that, I I love the way he's. He was able to bait Charlo in not only to throw in the right hand, but every once in a while he'd get Charlo to throw the jab, and then he'd immediately come over the top with his own right hand jab. So, uh, and you know, Charlo, to his credit, he was taking the the power punches. 
uh, you know, well. I mean, he was barely blinking with a lot of these flush shots, but you could tell that he respected the power because if he didn't, he would have done more what he did in the 12th where he tried to walk him down and, and throw the combinations. Me, personally, I couldn't see a 10-8, you know, in the 12th round. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think you could argue it because Korbov was reeling for a while, but, you know, it started to level out, I, I think, around the two-minute mark and then, you know, Charlo started laying a, a few more good punches, but uh, to me, I just didn't see a ten eight there. You know, I like to keep that sort of stuff to a, you know, a knockdown or something. Why? Well, because it wasn't Why? that bad. I mean, it wasn't because that it, bad. He got his ass no, kicked the entire last three minutes, and this is the thing. No, he, but he didn't. Hey, yeah, he did. What, no, he John? Didn't. Did he get his ass whipped in the last three minutes? Well, he was he was badly hurt, you know, and there Thank was no you. round like that in the fight. And, and that's, that's where getting, why I thought, I thought yeah. it deserved the extra point because it was a dominant performance in the twelfth round. I thought Jeremiah and John. Thank you for agreeing with me. That's the first time we've ever done that. Yeah, I, it's just, I can see the case for I I can see the case for the penny. I didn't do it. I'm like, hey, I John, just like, John, you know, just stop bit. there. We're good. We're good. Well, go ahead, Jeremiah. All right. I, <laughs> I, I, I well, you, you, well, I mean, the thing for me, the thing for me is, I, I could see how you could, you know, you could see that, but the, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of people, again, that I that I saw on social media, they didn't see that, you know, they didn't. Yeah, but because the good thing about me is, I don't really give a damn what anybody else thinks, except myself. Right. Okay. Right, but I, I like to see, I like to see it. You know, I, I like to look at people who are also informed and, and see the way they were swayed as well, because it. it and sometimes I like to check my own opinion because we're all biased, you know, and sometimes right. we put on the rose tinted glasses and, and, you know, we, we see things that aren't right. there. We're just paying attention to, to, to guys, you know, a particular guy's work. And yeah, again, but remember I like this, to... I hate the Charlos, so I didn't have well, rose colored but... glasses. That's just honestly <laughs> no, I, what I, I thought. I, but, but Jeremy, Maya makes a good point with that's what I try to do with the biases too. I like to look at the odds before a fight and then I like to look at, not everybody, but credible people like, and he pointed out a lot of the good people I also consider credible. And then, you know, just kind of at least compare. It doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to change, but it makes sure I'm not, you know, keep, keep yourself from going off out on the rails a little too much. You sometimes. know what I do? I just check Dan Raphael's score and whatever that fat bastard says at ESPN. If I'm opposite of him, I figure I'm up the right track because he's an idiot. But well, I, I'm, I more, think I'm we'll, more like Jared. I'm more like Jeremiah. I like to look at, you know, I like Idick a lot. You know, uh, he he's reasonable. You know, I like to look at Coppinger's quite a bit. You know, some Fisher. Guys, like you know some of the guys he's mentioned. There's just you know, real to me like real journalists who try not to be biased. Uh, oh. Where none of us are perfect, and you know that 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 gives you at least some idea. But we agree, right? So pr- prime Korobov beats Charlo. Yeah. I think a lot of people beat Charlo, and I think this. I think the next time Charlo even says Canelo, somebody should smack him right in the mouth because Canelo Alvarez would beat his ass half to death. And yeah, so, I mean, so would Gennady Golovkin, so would Daniel Jacobs. Yeah, man. I, I mean, it's it's like, you know, a lot of these guys are, are making the Charlos out to be some sort of boogeyman. And, uh, you know, after this performance, I, I mean, you know, again, the, the smaller Charlo, he wasn't convincing very many people, but – after these performances, nobody, nobody's, nobody should see them as boogeymen. You know, Golovkin, all the guys he named. Uh, you know, even the lesser guys like De- Devranchenko, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, no reason to be particularly uh, frightened by these guys' performances. All right, next I'm up. not going to count. Out, I'm not going to count out. I'm not going to count out Jamal though. Um, I think what he did, Korobov was very tricky. Like Jeremiah is saying, you know, his pedigree showed especially on short notice. I give him a ton of credit. He really found a home for that uh, left-hand counter. But I think what Jamal did was a little bit like Wilder early in the Ortiz fight. And actually, believe it or not, I think Wilder made a better adjustment. Uh, You know, he he just wasn't – he was fighting like he was fighting a right-hander. You know, he was being stubborn. He wasn't adjusting his style. And, you know, when you do that against a good southpaw like a Korobev or an Ortiz – you're going to have problems. You just can't go in there like you're fighting a right-hander uh, with, with a guy you're not that much superior than who has skills and amateur pedigree and get away with it. And I, and I think that's what happened to Jamal Charlo tonight. So, so you agree. I'm, I'm not going to get. So you agree Jamal Charlo's not really got much of a chance to be that good because even Deontay Wilder technically was better than him. 
Well, you got to look at what Southpaw, you know, uh, you, you, you hate saying it, but uh, he would have a lot of trouble with a Billy Joe Saunders. <laughs> you could say that after. Deontay Wilder? Uh, I think he would, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Saunders was a cruiserweight. Saunders was oh, a cruiserweight. Yeah. He was a cruiserweight. Saunders so slapped like, the shit out of him. Match, yeah, All right, let's but, go to uh, Manchester. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. You're not done? No, go ahead. All right, go ahead. let's go so, to so, I'm not counting out Jamal, but Jamal, Jamal I'm not particularly uh, that high on. I think, you know, Jarrett Hurd is far, far superior to him. All right, next up, Josh Warrington beats Carl Frampton. He beat him fairly convincingly, I thought, Jeremiah. And I think Josh Warrington, I think that we have misjudged him. I think he's much better than what we thought he was. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I, I this is pretty common in boxing, however. I mean, you get a guy who is is a real workhorse, but he doesn't pack a punch. And, and that screams to a lot of people that he shouldn't be able to hang with the elites because generally the elite guys have exceptional hand speed or power or – you know, a combination of these things. Uh, like you look at Gary Russell Jr., who's also in the division. I mean, arguably the fastest hands in boxing. You know, Leo Santa Cruz showed his versatility against Frampton. And uh, again, you look at these guys and, and you're like, oh, well, I can't, I don't see them reaching the pinnacle. But after that performance, I mean, it showed his versatility was greater than a lot of people thought. I mean, it seemed like most people were weighing on Frampton. You know, he's been near the top for a longer period of time. He's fought a higher caliber of opposition, but Warrington, to his credit, he's he's a tall guy. His inside game is nuanced. I really like how he was pushing uh, Frampton up against the ropes. He he would give him give him a. a a push with his shoulder and then he would start working upstairs and downstairs and he had some creativity to his combinations as well. Now, you know, he wasn't afraid to let his hands go. He wasn't afraid to take a punch if need be, uh, you know, and not only that, his footwork was, was pretty good as well. I mean, uh, you know, I was surprised because Frampton would, would pretty much do nothing. He, he would barely follow Warrington around whenever Warrington would make these footwork adjustments. You know, we decided to go his left, decided to go his right, and then he, he would, you know, settle down and get back to work. And uh, that's, you know, and then when they got to the inside fighting, Warrington surprised me also because, you know, he, you would think that Frampton, a guy with shorter arms, quicker hands, he would dominate the inside game. Uh, but no, Warrington, again, he was creative with, with everything that he was doing. He was physical, and, and he outworked the guy, and I was happy to see him get the decision. Uh, to be honest with you, I'd prefer to see him against a guy like Oscar Valdez. I think that would be a damn good scrap. Uh, and now, you know, I think a lot of people would see that as a pick 'em fight, but good for Warrington. I mean, he's one of those blue collar guys like Ricky Hatton. You know, that's why you, you saw the, the, the huge following. He said he's had a big following for years now, but he, he's, this is increasing because of his victories and, and good for him. It was a good fight. You know, it had a real raucous atmosphere, you know, something you could only get there. You'd have this big, you know, again, it, it wasn't too tense, but you had this kind of like Catholic Protestant thing, you know, going on. It was just really cool to see. And I'm happy for Warrington. And again, I hope he moves on to Oscar Valdez or even Leo Santa Cruz. Yeah. And what made it even better is you had Thomas Triver, the best ring announcer out there. Jeron, do you agree with Jeremiah? Yeah, first for me, full disclosure, I did see some of the fight, but I focused on White Chisora too and watched all of that. And with the conflicting times, I have not seen the entire uh, Frampton Warrington fight. I thought it, you know, I thought Frampton, you know, had been slipping just a little bit. That was confirmed. I'm not taking anything away from Warrington. He's definitely better than we thought. I do agree. You know, we all agree on that. You know, you could see that in the Selby fight, and then you could see that again tonight. Uh, actually, it's funny Jeremiah pointed that out, and I, I do that, and I still do it, and I think it's a good thing to look at. I mean, when I'm evaluating a prospect on the way up or a fighter, one of the first things I look at is what kind of firepower they have. That, uh, that's something that I usually look at right off the bat, and that's something Warrington doesn't have, so... Yeah, it is unusual, and I, I think it's still right to do that because there aren't that many exceptions. He He's proven to be one against Selby and Frampton. And really, uh, you know, Santa Cruz isn't a bad matchup for him because Santa Cruz isn't a big puncher, and Leo Santa Cruz is a very good fighter. But, you know, he's volume, not a big puncher. Warrington's not a big puncher. He's high volume. But that's not a bad, ma- not a bad style matchup for Warrington. And Jeremiah pointed out Valdez, that might even – 
maybe that's even more likely to happen. I don't think Valdez has been that impressive. So uh, not a horrible matchup there for him. So, uh, you know, usually an underpowered guy is going to have a problem, but uh, it, it's featherweight, and, and he's, he's definitely uh, entrenched himself uh, with the guys at the top of the division. Uh, if Gary, you know, Gary, an active Gary Russell, which we know we don't get an active Gary Russell, but I don't see, you know, I'm not taking away from Warrington, but, but that's to me where like a Gary Russell is still a level above as a fighter. Yeah, but uh, you, you don't know, have that. that so that, that is taken right, away right, from right. him. Well, that's the thing, Gary Russell. But but still, the Gary Russell. You know, I, I don't think I don't see Warrington being able to handle the Gary Russell that just fought JoJo Diaz. So, in that sense, I'm going to still stay with it, even though he's not as active as we would like. I think I thought Diaz performed real well, but now Diaz can't make 126 pounds. So, you know, he takes himself out of that mix, which we as we discussed earlier this week, too many weight classes, too many belts, and you you lose a lot of fights along the way. All right, next up, we go to a different part of London, the O2 Arena. Derek Chisora loses at 11-round brawl to Dillian White, or as about as much as you get of a brawl for heavyweights. Um, Jeremiah, what was your take? Did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah, I, I squeezed in as much as, as I could between, uh, you know, with the while watching the Brazil fight. And, uh, yeah, needless to say, that that was a hell of a heavyweight scrap. Uh, I mean, it, again, you know, as I talked about on the show before, so long as you pair these guys correctly, there's some enjoyment to be had in the heavyweight division. And, and it was a damn good scrap. Both of these guys showed up in tip-top shape. Uh, you know, it looked like to me that White was kind of saving himself for the later rounds. You know, I think recognizing that he faded in the Parker fight, uh, Chisora, to me, you know, started strong early. And it, it, again, there was this, uh, you know, and I, I like the fact that both seem to focus more on the jab than they had done in the past. Um, you know, and, and to me, it looks like White has improved uh, since the Joshua fight. I mean, technically, he's still sort of sloppy and, uh, you know, like especially as his straight right hand, it's 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 not so straight, I guess. Uh, maybe you just call it a cross, I suppose. But it, yeah, it was a good fight and, you know, big domestic British showdown and uh, it was kind of painful to hear Anthony Joshua ringside doing commentary. You know, like we talked about off air, he wasn't Sugar Ray Leonard bad, but uh, I didn't really find any of his input all that fascinating. Or uh, yeah, but it was a, yeah, it was a good fight. And again, I'm I'm glad that they're doing this sort of thing. I mean, it was it was unfortunate, however, that you know Warren and Eddie Hearn had to put these two cards on at the same time you know both ask for money uh, I don't understand why you couldn't have just done it a week before or whatnot it, it just kind of seemed a bit odd there and unnecessary but I was happy and that left hook that white landed to finish the job you know kudos to him that was a short punch and and you know laid Chisora out and uh, I don't think there's there's any doubt at this point that White is at the very least a top five heavyweight. Uh, his resume is pretty good. They keep sticking him in with tough tough guys, and he keeps coming out on top. So kudos to him. Uh, I, I fear a little bit that he may get Anthony Joshua if Joshua can't get Wilder or Fury uh, in in April of next year. But we'll just see how things pan out. And uh, uh, yeah, again, we'll just wait and see. All right, um, John, you agree with Jeremiah? Well, it was with uh, mo- a lot of it, but uh, you know, I think that uh, I don't, I don't really buy the Dillian White has improved. I see a lot of the Brits saying it. He's getting results, but he's, you know, he he's just to me, he's just a he's a limited guy. This was a really good fight. Uh, it's been a heck of a year for the heavyweights. Aren't I, all I, the I heavyweights limited? I, well, you don't think that you don't degree. think Deontay Wilder is limited. Not, not, I, I don't, I don't think the, the guys are limited to the extent Dillian White is, um, and that's, you know, that that's my okay. take on it. What can Wilder that, do? Wilder just can knock you out, and if he doesn't, he loses. Well, Wilder, you know, as you saw in the first Brazil fight, he he can he can move around, you know, when he needs to. He's got good stamina. He's got a good jab. You know, he punches punches a lot harder. Uh, you know, I will give Dillian White credit. You know, it's to me, it's. Yeah, I didn't think that left hook was really. Yeah, he he, he got there first uh, before Chisora, but I I Dillian White throws like a he throws wide looping shots. He, 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 I mean he's 
he's landed that left-hand bomb. I got to give him credit for that. He's landed that left-hand bomb against Brown. You know, he dropped Parker with it. Uh, Parker's, you know, has had a good chin through, through his career. Uh, you know, and he just took Shazor out with it. That's, that's what I'm going to give him credit for in recent fights. I mean, and that's uh, that's this year. So, you know, so basically that, that the big wide, swinging that, punch. I mean, if he would the, throw straight, precise punches like Wilder, do you think he would be better? Well, I think my uh, when Wilder would take Dillian, Dillian White out within five rounds. So I got no problem stating that unequivocally. So, uh, you know, I think how they match up there, that's right there. I, I don't think like a Dillian White, though, he doesn't match up with a Fury, a Joshua, or a uh, Wilder to me. Uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a Joshua rematch in April, I don't think he lasts five rounds with him. No, but Joshua. Joshua is like heads and shoulders technically above Wilder. So you wouldn't expect that. Jeremiah, would you give White a better chance against Wilder? A better chance than... You think he can win? Did he would have... Because Joshua, I think, is all wrong for him. Where Wilder, I mean, is technically so bad that I think White would have a chance because he's a tough guy that can punch. Yeah, I think when you get guys who have, you know, two guys who have poor technique, I mean, you're always running the risk of, you know, one of the guys getting caught slow, you know, throwing a sloppy shot and getting counterpunched. Uh, you know, I mean, I think White is better than, you know, Gerald Washington or, you know, Chris Areola or Eric Molina, plenty of guys who went past five rounds with uh, Deontay Wilder. I mean, the, pro- the problem with, you know, all of these guys, you know, their defense is lacking. So yeah. there's always there's always the, you know, the possibility that somebody can get caught with a power shot and get out of there pretty soon. But I, I, I think with White's improved jab, I, I, yeah, I, th- I think he would last longer than five rounds. And, and again, it's because I, I think poor guys – have lasted longer. And I, I think guys had a, not as tough either. Again, I, I don't, you know, Washington was, his technique is pretty good, but you know, to me, he isn't as good as Dillian White is. And of course it's all a styles thing, but you know, Chris Ariola lasted nine rounds and Ariola is, is Spilka. Uh, yeah. I mean, Spilka is a Southpaw, so I'm, I'm willing to grant some leniency there, but Chris Ariola and Eric Molina, um, I'm not because neither one of those guys would beat Dillian White. Uh, so I, again, I wouldn't mind seeing it. I mean, sorry, aside from all the alphabet trinket nonsense, I, I don't know where they go from there. But what I do know is Eddie Hearn has a pretty rock solid roster of heavyweights under his his uh, command, you know. And so, uh, you know, maybe like we were talking about last week, we might get. Uh, you know, Dillian White versus, uh, you know, Povetkin and, and Luis Ortiz versus Joe Joyce. I mean, there are plenty of fights that he can make uh, that we can all, you know, just have fun with for the time being. And and I hope that's the way it goes, because I, I honestly don't want to see Dillian White against Deontay Wilder at the moment. Uh, you know, I, I want Fury and, and White or sorry, Fury and, and Wilder and Joshua. I want them to sort that all out. I don't care about any of the mandatory nonsense. I just I want a real champion. I want to know that there's a man at, at you know 200 plus, and that's all I'm concerned about. Just just make the fun stuff, you know. Again, White Pavetkin, uh, Joyce Ortiz, or you know any mixture of them. Just just make that on the what side. What about Darrell Miller? Where's he standing, this Jeremiah? Uh, yeah, I think Miller is a, a fun guy too, and I, I think that you know he could be paired with a good number of these guys and and bring us some excitement. You know, so far, uh, you know, he's been doing pretty good against, uh, you know, overmatched opposition. I mean, you know, beating Duhapas or or Vak or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, any of these guys. I mean, they're they're unfortunately a lot of them are, are not really giving us. Uh, much to go on. I mean, I think Will Miller's a tough guy, but he's not really getting cracked by good punchers. So to me, you'd have to pair him with a Dillian White or or somebody like Brazil. I, I think I wouldn't mind seeing Brazil uh, Miller. I think that would be an, an interesting and fun fight for the time being. I don't think that you know Miller would get White or or Ortiz at this point. So again, uh, pair him against Brazil. Uh, you know, that'll be fun. Let's just see what they got. I mean, but I think he provides some some enjoyment, uh, but I don't really, you know, after the top three, it's or the top three or top four, or top five. Uh, you know, there's not really much to to sort between them. John. Yeah, I think the top three guys, I, I think Fury, 
Joshua and Wilder are on a different level than the other guys. I, I think that, like, you look at White, though, against Chisora tonight. Uh, you know, Jarrell Miller, maybe he should be a little bit lighter, but he's got the look of a guy that takes a good shot. He throws an unbelievable amount of punches for a heavyweight, never mind how big he is. If Derek Chisora was backing up Dillian White, I mean, Jarrell Miller would go right through White, and, and that's what I think would happen. Uh, I, don't, I think we're going to get White and Joshua again. I'm with Jeremiah. You know, I, I just want Fury, Joshua, and Wilder fighting it out. Uh, I think that's good for boxing. That's what we need. Uh, I think Fury and Wilder will fight again, though, and Joshua. I, I don't buy talk that he's going to fight Miller. I think he'll fight White again. And then if I had to lay money down, I'd say he'll fight Usyk in the fall. That, that would be my bet. Um, but, you know, White, I, I don't want to see White Joshua, too. Uh, I don't need, you know, I, my feeling is I don't need to see that. So, uh, you know, it'd be great to have White and Miller fight. Hearn can make that tomorrow. But uh, I don't think he's gonna. I don't think he's gonna make it. Yeah, but I would rather see. I'd rather see White get a shot than Miller because Miller doesn't deserve a shot. He hasn't beaten anybody. But shot, shot at what? That's why I'm with Jeremiah. You know, shot we're at Joshua. About, if uh, somebody's got to fight him, why do you want a guy that White, has White, not White, even fought a top ten guy? Joshua already knocked out White. We don't, yeah. we don't need to. We don't need to see that again. Okay. Uh, so Miller, we need Miller to see him fight a guy that's attributes. nothing. Miller brings different attributes. Yeah, he's that fat. Nobody's sure he can't exactly how going to play out. He's fat and he can't punch. What is his other attributes? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he can't punch. He can't punch. But, you know, look at his knockouts. Now, the look fact that a year percentage. ago, look at his knockouts. Who the fuck did he knock out? Well, so look at his knockout percentage. Well, he knocked out <laughs> Wax, who Vladimir Klitschko couldn't stop. So, wait you know, a second. I think when Vladimir did Klitschko Klitschko's fight a pretty good Vok? puncher. When did Klitschko fight Vuk? He didn't how, knock him out. Years he went ago. Oh, Jesus. Him. All right. Well, you know what? Larry Holmes knocked out Muhammad Ali, so he's better than Muhammad Ali. But when you do something six or seven years later, it's usually not that big a deal. And if Marcus Vaught could still fight, they wouldn't have had Jarrell Miller in against him because they haven't put Jarrell Miller in against anybody yet. No. Vaught Walk takes a good shot, and Miller got him out of there. It, uh, did he knock him out? He stopped him. I thought that was an injury or something. Maybe I'm mistaken. No, it was a, stop, it was a stoppage. Because Inj- he broke his hand. Hit, hit, he hit, didn't hit, get knocked out. Get, Did he injured, get knocked down? He broke, his head, he broke his hand from getting hit in the head too many times. Well, I mean, I, I would uh, just intervene and say that I I could stand a Miller fight, but mostly if it's – aimed at gathering American fans. So if, if Joshua came over here and fought in New York City and, and fought Miller as some kind of American home, you know, some kind of a, uh, you know, American tour, I, I wouldn't mind that so much. Wait a Again, second, I, Jeremiah. You, we're the guys that always bitch about fights like that. I mean, he is not a top 10 heavyweight. He, he, look at he this. He, he, heavy, Mike, he's how a, he's how is he a top, top 10, 10 heavyweight? He's, 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 you can't rank him ahead of White. Top, you Mike, can't wreck him ahead against trans- Dominic he, Brazil. What the hell he, has he done? Transna- he's in transnational's top ten. He's in the ring's top yeah, ten. Yeah, and that's bullshit. Because you cannot tell me a guy who's beating Bogdan Dinu, Thomas Adamick, who 10 years ago, that had been a good win, Johan Duhapis, who everybody beats the hell out of, and he couldn't knock out Duhapis, but Duhapis could take a punch. He didn't knock out Vok. Vok broke his hand. His best win is against Gerald Washington, who is limited at best. I mean, he beats Fred Cassie. Come on. That's not a top 10 heavyweight. He's not Joseph. Joseph Parker deserves that shot in a rematch before this guy does, because I guarantee you this. That is not a top ten resume in any division, except maybe super middleweight. I guarantee you that odds makers will make Miller a much <sighs> closer shot against Joshua than White or any Parker or any. I don't know what yeah. odds makers have to do with this. Odds makers, once again, which I know you don't understand this because we've went over it before. Odds makers are trying to get even money bet on both sides. They're not picking winners. They're trying to get even money. On both sides. Now, I know that odds makers know more about sports than anybody else, but I also know this. We, we had odds maker on our show a couple years ago, or a couple months ago, and he told me, I said, do you pick winners? He said, no. 
He said, we're not qualified to do that. And I, I'll repost that interview for you, too. He said, what we're qualified at doing is judging who the people are going to vote on the most or bet on the most, and we want to get even money on that fight. And if you yeah, want, the, that, that is the point, Mike. That's the collective yeah. wisdom. The collective wisdom now, is of what people think. Anybody else's, of what people think. Anybody else's wisdom. They're the not predicting the fight, always, John. The, the collective wisdom always turns out better. That's why nobody no. can beat the odds Jesus. makers and go retire on an island. All right. Uh, all I know is this: we were told that it had nothing to do with who would win the fight. They said they gauge the public and what the public thinks. So the public will bet more on Jarrell Miller. But Jarrell Miller does not deserve a title shot. How can you say he does? First of all, title shot of what? Joshua just has alphabet belts. I don't worry about alphabet belts. It's just a matter of... Who's going right. to fight Joshua? Whatever. Who's going to fight Joshua? I know, Joshua? because wait that's a second. What, that's what wait, al- wait, 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 wait. So you're alpha, right. No, no, you're right. Alpha, that, I, I'm agreeing with you. Soup. I'm agreeing with you. Tyson Fury is still the champion then. So, who should Tyson Fury defend against? Who's the number one contender? Wait. I'm pretty sure. What are the rankings in the heavyweight division one through three, Jeremiah? That's Joshua one, Fury two, Wilder three. Thank you. So, when you look at it, I don't want to see Wilder fight either one of those guys because I want to see one and two fight to see who the real champion is. Wilder does not even belong in the conversation now. He lost that opportunity. He just, he just had a draw with it. With, with well, yeah, you're and on champion. that draw, so many people thought it was horseshit that they moved him over Wilder in the rankings. He, he just had a draw. Either either, either you view Fury as the champion, or you view it, or you view it as vacant. We're talking about who's going to fight Anthony. Yeah, well, all I'm telling Anthony you is Joshua. this. I mean, wait, what, wait why, when, when people are talking about people are One talking about Dillian White deserving a shot at Anthony Joshua, not when he got knocked out by him already, and nobody outside of the alphabets is rec- recognizing Joshua as the champion. Um, who's ranked number one in transnational, Jeremiah? Josh was ranked uh, number one across the board. Okay, who's ranked number two? Fury, across the board. So, once again, if Wilder was to fight Joshua right now, it's insignificant because it doesn't settle the title because one's supposed to fight two. So, Wilder... I'm not interested. I'm I'm not at this moment. I'd rather just have Fury and Wilder fight again at this moment. I'm not... So you don't want to see the two best guys. You don't want to see number one and number two fight. You want to see number two and number three fight. That makes no sense at all. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that thought Fury should have moved to number one. He's the the last guy to win the title in the ring. Well, number one, this is the only thing that matters is this. To have a heavyweight lineal championship, one fights two. So he's in that. So I don't think he cares if he's one or two. They need to fight. I mean, well, Deontay yeah, I mean, Wilder in Fury is just a joke now. I want to see one fight, two. I want to see a legitimate heavyweight champion. And the thing is this. Once that legitimate heavyweight champion is crowned, Jarrell Miller still doesn't deserve to fucking get a title defense or a title fight. Yeah, and I, w- I would say that. I mean, if, if you, the thing about it is even if you argue for, you know, Fury being the lineal or not, it, it, the thing about it, though, is – you know, they're, Joshua and Fury are number one and number two. And, you know, obviously that's a big sell in, in Britain as well. But, yeah, I mean, that is how we should look at it. I mean, we should look at it as if, you know, the number one and number two guys should settle things before, you know, anybody else gets a shot. But, unfortunately, you know, I think sometimes we get caught up in the the current structure of things. And, and you know, we're, we're playing along where we're like, oh, well, you know, Miller is – uh, you know, I know we don't care so much about the alphabet trinket stuff, but y- y- we start involving all the political nonsense that's that's incorporated into it. And and you know, I think I think this is how we come out with some of these outcomes sometimes. But yeah, I mean, number one and number two, I mean that that is what we should get if we want a brand new champion. I mean, even if even if uh, y- again, even if you you count uh, Fury as lineal champ and he's fighting three and Wilder, you know. Y- it, the the whole point to me, and I, I made this this before, is that even if 
uh, you know, Fury or Wilder, it, let's say they have a rematch, no matter who wins that fight, they're still not going to be viewed as as the man, really, because Joshua still is there, right? He's still in that position, and he he kind of looks he's a he looks like the man. He, again, he's not the man, but he's right there and he's solidified in his position. And you, you really got to beat him to kind of prove yourself. But yeah, I mean, you know, Miller. Uh, it, the problem with the heavyweight division is it's it's so bad that you can have guys like Miller in the top ten, regardless of of not beating. The top. In fact, that it's it's become an unfortunate thing across the board because. You know, there's so many divisions and it's thinned out all the talent that you you have guys like Miller, you know, entering the top 10, you know, the bottom part typically it, without beating, you know, these guys. You have a bunch of guys that are beating fringe contenders and and whatnot, and, and, and they're finding a place. They're finding a home. I still think – I think the division is picking up. I think that the division – this is going to go down as a good era for the division. Steve Farhood was – talking about that tonight as well before the um, wilder Chisora, excuse me, the uh, white Chisora fight on Showtime's U.S. broadcast. This is, this is you know, the best heavyweight era we're entering since those guys in the 90s. And, you know, it's going to keep getting better. I think that, again, Joshua Fury and Wilder clearly at the top. You've got some other developing guys. That's one of the reasons that, hey, I give White credit for some of his recent wins. I'm not arguing with what he's done where people are going to put him. But I, and, and he'll be in some entertaining fights, but I think when the dust settles, I don't think he's going to be one of the guys that's going to be one of the challenging factors for those top three guys. I think there's other guys that have potential to do that on their way up. And maybe you're even entering. I think there's the a ton team. of guys that could challenge those three top guys because I don't think it's just those three and everybody else. Because I think almost anybody in the top ten could get lucky or just flat out beat somebody that's in those top three. Um, I don't know. You got anything else you want to talk about, Jeremiah? <laughs> uh, yeah. What, what else did we see? Uh, uh, yeah, we saw Nathan Gorman's uh, performance on did the undercard. Did you see it? Yeah, that. All right, yeah, I didn't break it up because I thought you said you didn't see it. So, no, you're you're right. It wasn't as impressive as as you know we were hoping for. So, you know, like a lot of these guys, he's got to develop. Again, I see him more of like an Andy Ruiz kind of guy, yep. where if he he breaks the top ten, he's he's you know he's not ever getting in the top five just because of his his physical stature. Oh, geez, sorry, got some allergies or something messing with me. Uh, you but yeah, stay off the you know, nose candy, man. Come on. Uh, hey, <laughs> well, hey, man, I like to party. What can I say? <laughs> hey, you know what? Did you ever pet Eric Duran's new puppy? <laughs> uh, that was a good one, Mike. I gotta give you. I gotta give you credit for that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I I saw that. I saw you. You said I like to pet puppies, and I I I gotta admit, I laughed my ass off. I thought it was pretty funny. Showed my wife that comment. She got a good giggle out of it too. And I do like to pet puppies, but not, you know, not uh, puppies. Not puppies that big. You like smaller puppies? No, nah, I don't. I don't like <laughs> the, Boy, the head. On, the head on that puppy was huge. But go ahead, Jesus. keep going. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was like a steroid induced pit bull. I mean, that that thing was massive. <laughs> If nobody knows what we're talking about, if you're friends with Eric Duran, go click on his Facebook page. You'll find the picture. Go ahead. Yeah. Any, anyways, moving on from the uh, the gayer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, I don't, I don't even I don't even know where I was at now. I mean, I lost my train of thought. Um, Nathan Gorman. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. Anyways, yeah, he got he got the the points verdict over Rosvan Kajanu, but uh, hopefully they just got to move him correctly. They they got to get his timing and whatnot down a little bit better. They got to keep him behind the jab. And uh, also on that card, uh, um, I think Takam got a win as well. So I, I suppose that kind of puts him in the mix of. Uh, I think that was of, on you know, the other card, but yeah, he did. Get yeah, one. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that that kind of puts him back into the mix of things too. But it, you know, it was a good night, rock solid day. I mean, you know, aside from all the, uh, it, it's just I would just make the final point for me is that 
again, this is why boxing struggles to be a mainstream sport because it's constantly shooting itself in the foot. And, and John on our last show said that this is kind of an important bout, whether or not, you know, you saw the fights as mismatches or whatnot, you know, cause initially they were going to be pretty clear mismatches. I mean, very few thought Tony Harrison was going to win. Very few thought Tony Harrison did win, but uh, you know, the Willie Monroe thing was just, was just a mismatch as well. And, but you were hoping that a lot of people would tune in for it and they did some good stuff. I mean, you know, the telecast was all right and the commentary was, was better than it, it was on the zone sometimes, than but Sugar Ray Leonard, <laughs> yeah, much better than Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, some of it was, was hit or miss, but it, it was rock solid in its presentation, you know, and they kept playing the football music too. So I think that kind of gets people, people's attention. But when you have scorecards like this, when you've got controversy like this, this is not the kind of stuff that sells. This is the kind of stuff. If you are an old boxing fan, and I know plenty of people who have left the sport because of stuff like this. If you're an old boxing fan and you're sifting through the channels and you're like, wow, we got, we got some stuff on free TV. I want to see if the sport is improved. You know, are we still de- dealing with the same kind of stuff? And then you sit down and watch that card again. You you might just never come back to the score, uh, sport again just because you're getting the same old tired nonsense. Are you that talking we have about to the scores? With. Yeah, the scorecards. Because you, in you the seventies and the eighties, me and John saw the same stuff on a fairly regular basis. I think, didn't we, John? Yeah, there's always you, you always had. You've it always does had seem a little more problems. prevalent now than it used to, though. <laughs> well, and I I think that's I would say that I think it is. Partly because so many guys have their eggs in certain baskets now. Like DAZN has their thing, PBC has their thing, you know, Top Rank has their thing. So I think these promoters or, or managers are going out of their way more to to keep their guys with with shiny zeros in the loss column. And, and I'm not again. I'm not saying that this didn't happen early on. What I'm saying is if if you were a fan during those days and you came back and and you're like, oh well, you know, I missed boxing and I wouldn't mind getting back into it. And then you see the scores again and you're like, well, well, you know, it's just the same old, same old. I mean, the, the sport just keeps shooting itself in the foot. That's it, 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 it's just round and around we go. All right, um, Jer or John, do you have any final words? Plus, before we get off here, do you like to pet dogs? Uh I, I like I like dogs, but I don't have a dog right now. So I my but dog but if there was a dog so, there, so cross. If you saw Eric Duran's little puppy, you'd pet it, wouldn't you? I, I didn't I didn't see it. I didn't see the picture. So <laughs> just go ahead and say yell then. Yeah, yeah, you gotta take a look. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm. I don't know what I'm walking into here. So hey, I, I can tell you that. this: when you get off here and you go check out the picture, you'll laugh your ass off and you'll get this. So okay, I'm just gonna check. I'm gonna check out the picture first. But <laughs> no, I would, I would, just, I would just tie into what Jeremiah said. You know, it, it, and I had been saying it's an important night for boxing in the U.S. and and any you know British Europe, European listeners. Uh, you know, th- this stuff ends up driving the sport a lot because of, you know, like it or not, a lot of it still gets driven from the United States. So it's important. The good thing when the dust settled is like. I guess what I like about tonight that you don't have when even sometimes we have some of these scoring frustrations and, and things like that is, hey, this was free. <laughs> you know, this was free. Yeah, and the fights free weren't TV. bad. Yeah. The fights weren't bad. No, and they weren't. They weren't bad. Uh, and I, I like what Jeremiah, like, I agree with Jeremiah, like the telecast generally was good. I do have a little bit of, co- you know, commentary concerns in the sense you, you just hate to, hate to be picking on them and hope it gets better. But, you know, Joe Goosen kind of failed. With when he was TVKO in the early '90s yeah. on the pay per view, when he was the analyst, and Lennox Lewis was on HBO, and he kind of failed there. I get a little squeamish that you know we've got this big night in U.S. boxing, this big new deal, and and we're going w- with two commentators that were not successful. Mancini and his short stint on the top rank stuff on the True TV did really well. You can see he's good. I would. I would advocate, and maybe they'll do this. Sometimes they do things like this. Why not flip like Goosen and Lewis and Mancini, and and you know put Mancini with Albert on the uh, you know ringside analysis, and put put Goosen and Lewis up in the uh, you know in, in the overhead uh, host role with Chris Myers. I, I I would throw that one out there right <laughs> off. I'd li- I'd like to hear more Mancini. I thought everything you know, and then everything else was was pretty good. It wasn't. 
wasn't hard, but that, that worries me. Goosen and Lewis worry me a little bit moving forward. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a thing with a lot of shows. So, uh, and a lot Bring of back Al, Albert and Sean O'Grady. Uh, th- those guys were good. I mean, I, uh, I you agree. know, that was uh, a, yeah, they were, they were good. Uh, you know, I'm surprised really with what you got out there that, that nobody's brought O'Grady back. back in or that nobody's away. contacted us. <laughs> yeah, I would like to bring up advocated. to anybody out there that there are three of us and there were three people on the telecast. And I think me and John would give much more entertainment value than what we heard tonight. Well, what we got to give all of us is, and this is where we deserve credit, is you become, there's a value to being an information expert. And what I think people get confirmed is, I mean, confused is they say, well, this guy is a big trainer. This guy is a boxer. He must have more knowledge. If, if you're not following all the fighters, if you're not following all the fights, which as the three of us know, and everybody who listens to this show probably knows too, takes hours and hours and hours and then watching video reading these people that even are in the sport they can't make up those kind of hours they don't know the stuff because they just haven't put the yeah. hours in and if you're training so, the fighter in the main event you don't see what happens in the other fights really exactly you're, you're not putting the time in following all these other guys and all these other divisions and everything uh it's it's just a different it's just a different thing reading all the articles and things like that sure you're doing a lot of it but not like somebody who's just taking it in for the whole sport so there really is an expertise and there's just a value of simply having put in the time to to follow everything that's going on in the sport and these a lot of the people they put on just haven't put in that kind of time so the question for anybody listening live jeremiah is this when i post this show should we picture put a picture of eric duran's dog on the page for the show jesus dude don't do it no i don't think so (laughs) Because uh, you know what's going to happen is I'm going to end up sharing the hell out of the show like I always do. And people <laughs> you're like, what is going on? And then they're going to have to listen in for like, you know, an hour before they get what's going on. I mean, I'm probably in, in the stricter groups where they got, you know, the moderators got to approve the content. I'm probably not going to get that through. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess we're going to wrap it up. Do we want to do next Thursday or Friday night a year end show? Because Thomas Triber would like to come on and talk about the fights he just did and to also give us opinions on fighter to year, fighter to year, stuff like that. I'm in. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we can we can certainly do it. All right, guys. So catch us at the end of next week with our year in show. I um, want to remind you all, you can hear Survive in Advance with me and Steve Risley every Monday through Friday at noon. You can go to thegirlytruth.net. Here are interviews with Pete Quinn, who is the voice of the Purdue Boilermakers. Um, also, this last week, we had Oliver Luck on, the commissioner of the XFL, former NFL quarterback, West Virginia star. I know John and former Oliver West Virginia Luck. And former West Virginia athletic director. Yeah, he's a very bright guy, so hopefully he can yeah. keep Vince McMahon on the straight and narrow. Also, we had and Trevor law- and, and, and And lawyer. Yeah. Well, we don't hold that against him because he doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> He's gotten a job that's actually legit. Um, then, <laughs> I'm just kidding. John's the only legit lawyer I do know, though. But also, we had Trevor Harris from the Grey Cup Runners Up, the, Tre- the Ottawa Red Blacks on our show also. That was on Tuesday or Wednesday. So you can go check those out at thegrillingtruth.net. Make sure to check out all of our Boxing Legends interviews. We've had guys like Mike McCollum, Larry Holmes, George Foreman, just to name a few. So make sure you go to the Grueling Truth. Go in the search bar, punch in boxing, hit it there. Jeremiah, you want to tell people about your new email newsletter? Yeah, so we just started some email stuff to keep people up to date. It is called TGTN Punchline. It's a newsletter you get three times a week. Again, to keep you up with the best and latest content over at The Grueling Truth, keep you guys involved. You know, we appreciate everybody who tunes in week in and week out, reads our content, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And I would also just say that, that, again, if if you find value in this podcast, Go to iTunes, go to wherever you can listen, you know, wherever you listen to, whatever your preferred platform, give us a thumbs up, give us a five-star review, uh, you know, one or two sentences. Just give us a shout-out, guys. 
All right. Um, you know, maybe we should have named this show TGT and Punchline. Yeah, that actually wouldn't have been bad. It wouldn't have. You think it's too late to change it? Yeah, I mean, we're two years in, so probably. <laughs> yeah, actually, we're three years in, I think, now. Just the first year was Dave instead of you. Uh, yeah. you, you, you the you Dark Ages. Both, you, you oh, can call it both at the same, same time. I think time Dave Sidorsky still listens. Don't call him the Dark Ages. I like Dave. <laughs> What'd you say, John? I said you can always call it Inside Boxing Weekly and TG. TN Punchline. TN Punchline at the same time for a while. Yeah, and the Deontay Wilder show for John. All right, guys, we're going to wrap the show up. Remember, you can hear us on iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for John Einreinhofer, Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak.